Hi there, Mr. Holcomb here with another episode of The Math Behind the Modules. This is Lesson 10, Linear Models. Okay, so classwork, it says, in previous lessons, to use data that follow a linear trend either in the positive direction or the negative direction and informally fit, informally fit a line through the data. You determine the equation of an informal fitted line and use it to make predictions. In this lesson, you use a function to model a linear relationship between two numerical variables and interpret the slope and intercept of the linear model in the context of the data. Recall that a function is a rule that relates a dependent variable x to an independent variable y. In statistics, a dependent variable is also called a response variable or a predicted variable. An independent variable is also called an explanatory variable or a predictor variable. Okay, response variable, explanatory variable. Example one, predicting the value of a numerical dependent response variable based on the value of a given numerical independent variable has many applications in statistics. The first step in the process is to identify the dependent or the predicted variable and the independent or predictor variable. There may be several independent variables that might be used to predict a given dependent variable. For example, suppose you want to predict how well you are going to do on an upcoming stats quiz. One possible independent variable is how much time you spent studying for the quiz. What are some other possible numerical independent variables that could relate to how well you are doing on the quiz? Okay, a couple of the factors might come into play here. How, what will help you do well on the quiz? Studying. How much did you pay attention in class? How much sleep did you get the night before the quiz? Did you eat a good breakfast before the quiz? Those are all other variables that we could use. Okay, so exercises one through two. It says for each of the following dependent or response variables, identify two possible numerical independent explanatory variables that might be used to predict the value of the dependent variable. So in number one, it says the height of a sun. So what predicts someone's height? Well, maybe mom's height. could predict the height of the child or dad's height could predict the height of the child. Okay, number of points scored in a game by a basketball player. Okay, well, what could, what could be a, a variable that would affect how many points someone scores? Okay, number of shots taken can't score unless you shoot. Okay, and number of minutes played. Okay, can't score if you're sitting on the bench. Number of hamburgers to make for a family picnic. Okay, what could predict the outcome of how many hamburgers you make? Well, then let's see, you don't want to make too many, throw, throw some away, and you don't want to be too short and have people leave hungry. So what could affect the number of burgers made? Number of family members that you have to feed. Okay. Uh, there's plenty of other ones. The cost of hamburger meat, maybe. If hamburger's too expensive, then you might want to go to make fewer hamburgers and have hot dogs ready as well. Okay. Uh, time it takes a person to run a mile. Contributing factors are... Um, How much did you train? Number of days trained.
Okay. And if you watch football and your team is playing in Denver, the Mile High Stadium, uh, it usually wears on the visiting team because of the altitude. So that's another factor that could come into play, altitude. The higher you are, the less oxygen. Okay. Um, amount of money won by a contestant on Jeopardy. Okay. Number of correct responses. And if you watch Jeopardy, you could also determine um, amount wagered on the doubles. That makes a big difference. You have a daily double. And if you wager 100 bucks and you get it right, you only got the $100, but you can wager up to what the amount of money you have. So if you have $4,000 and you wager all 4000 and get it right, you just doubled your money. Okay, so those are different factors. Okay, so anyhow, I'm going to skip the rest of those. You get the idea. Uh, number two, now we're going to reverse our thinking. Now they're going to give us independent variables and they want us to come up with a dependent variable. So it says uh, for each of the following numerical independent variables, write a possible numerical dependent variable. Okay, age of a student. Um, and then the dependent variable would be time it, time it takes to do something. Um, Okay, the example they give would be time it takes to run a mile. Okay, height of a golfer. So if you substitute in an, in an equation, okay, I have a six foot tall golfer and he can do this, or I have a six foot three golfer and he can do this, what do you think in that game would change because of the height of the golfer? And possibly what, distance of drives? Off the tee? Okay. Amount of pain reliever taken. Length of time it takes for pain to go away. And I'll do one more. Number of years of education. Okay, what can be the dependent variable there? So you get, you finish high school and then you go out into the workforce. What kind of job are you going to get? Or you go get an associate's degree, which is two years, and then you go into the workforce with an associate's degree. What jobs can you get with that? You get a bachelor's degree. What kind of job can you get with that? Master's degree, what kind of job? Doctorate, what kind of job? Okay, as the number of years of education increases, money made over a lifetime money made over a lifetime could be affected by the number of years of education okay so i'm just going to do those four and then we'll stop there okay example two a cell phone company offers the following basic cell phone plan to a customer a customer pays a monthly fee of forty dollars Okay, that is a constant. In addition, the customer pays 15 cents per text message. So that is a coefficient. And text message T is the variable. There is no limit on the number of text messages per month that could be sent, and there is no charge for receiving text messages. It's just sending. 
determine the following. Justin never sends a text message. What would be his total monthly cost? So I'll use C for cost equals zero T, zero texts, plus that $40 monthly fee. Well, zero times T is zero, zero plus 40 is $40. Okay, so notice I wrote a formula, substituted in the givens, and solved. Now it says during a typical month, Abby sent 25 text messages. What is her total cost for a typical month? So cost equals 25 texts. Actually, this is wrong up here. Let me fix this. If my equation is... 0.15t is what I should have written. 0.15t is our equation. 15 cents per text. And now I substitute in my givens. 0.15 times 0 text plus $40. The answer was correct. I just didn't show my work properly. And I really want you to do that correctly. So 0.15 times 0 is 0 plus $40 is $40. Okay. So now let's move on to the next problem. C equals 0 0.15 cents per text plus $40. So always write the formula first. Substitute in the givens. So 0.15 times 25 plus 40. So C equals well, 25 times 10 is 250. And half of 25 is 1250. So that's half of 10 or 5. So 250 plus 1250 is, or 250 plus 125 is 325, or 32.50 plus 40. Let me just get the calculator and check that. Okay, good thing I got my calculator late in the day here and I made a mistake. 15 cents times 25 text is $3.75. Plus that 40, so my total cost is $43.75. Okay, part C. Robert sends at least, at least 250 text messages a month. What would be an estimate of the least his total monthly cost would likely to be? So the least is $250. So if I take that C equals 15 cents times time, or times text, plus $40, and I say C equals 0.15, and the minimum is 250 texts, because he said at least 250 texts a month, plus $40. Then C equals, well, 15 cents times 25 is 375, or $3.75, then 0 0.15 times 250 is just moving the decimal over one place. So it would be $37.50 in texting plus that $40. Okay, so C equals $77.50. Okay, number four. Use descriptive words to write a linear model describing the relationship between the number of text messages sent and the total monthly cost. Okay, so you'd say, so this is C, so total monthly cost, can't spell total, total monthly Okay, M-O-N-T-H-L-Y. Sorry about that. Total monthly cost equals $40, or I will say number of texts, number of texts, times... 0.15 plus $40. So all we're doing is changing the variable to a word. So C is total monthly cost and T is number of texts. Okay, number five. Is the relationship between the number of text messages sent and the total monthly cost linear? Okay, 
The answer is yes. The cost of text is our rate of change, or our slope is our rate of change. And it is constant. It never changes. They don't charge 15 cents per text. Then once you go over a certain amount, charge more, it stays the same. 15 cents per text, no matter how many you text. Okay, number six. Let x represent the independent variable and y represent the dependent variable. Use the variables x and y to write the function representing the relationship you indicated in exercise four. So total monthly cost is y equals 0.15x plus $40. Okay, here it says explain what the 15 cents represents in this relationship. Well, it's the slope or rate of change. How much the cost you pay every month increases per text. Explain what the $40 represents in the relationship. That is a constant. The constant um, monthly fee. It never changes. It doesn't matter if you've been a member for a month or five months. They're char charging you $40 every month. Number nine now says to sketch a graph of this relationship on the following coordinate grid. Clearly label the axes and include the units in the label. Okay, so down here would be number of texts. That's our X or T. Okay, and this is our Y, or I was calling it earlier, C for cost. Let's just stick with X and Y for now. Okay, so number of texts, zero, flat cost. $40 a month fee, $40. And then we calculated some values, and let's just use those. So at 25 text, it was $43.75. So if we come back here, for 25 text was 40, and 50 is here, one, two, three, four, five. So that's two each. So there's 42, 44, so it's just under the 44 mark, which is about here, 43.75. Now if I go back to my values here, 250 text was $77.50. 250 text is way over here, and 77, this is really difficult on this fine grid. Okay, let me get my rulers. I like using the rulers to find my proper location. You'll see what I mean when I do this, if you haven't seen my prior videos. So if I sw swipe this around and make it vertical and I put it right at 250, like so, it keeps track of that line for me. Trying to be as accurate as possible. As soon as I move my pen, it moves. Okay, there we go. And then the cost was 7750. Well, here's 70, 72, 74, 76, 78. Just below 78 is right about there. Okay, so there's my point for 250 texts. Now, if I draw a straight line from the y intercept, which is my cost per month. Trying to be very accurate here, then each of those points is going to land on that line. So there it is, in fact, linear. If I wanted to know how many 150 texts would cost, I'd go up here and then over, and it would be about 62 and change. Okay, so there is a labeled axis. Oh, this is number of texts. This is cost, total cost per month. Number 10, Lemoyne needs four more pieces of lumber for his scout project. The pieces can be cut from one large piece of lumber according to the following pattern. 
Okay, so here it says the lumberyard will make the cuts for Lemoyne at a fixed cost of $225 plus, plus an additional cost of 25 cents per cut. One cut is free. So they're going to cost, they're going to charge $225. So I'm going to say Y equals X plus 225. Okay. But they're charging two dollars or they're charging 25 cents per cut, but one is free. So number of cuts minus one. Okay, so I need to change that a little bit. So it's a number of cuts minus one. So I'm going to move this. First, let me move this over, make some more room. Okay, it's all connected, so let's just do this. And I'm going to put minus one, x minus one, because the first cut's free. And then I'm going to say plus $2.25. And each cut after the first one is 25 cents. So here's my equation. So let's think about this. If I plugged in one cut, one cut is one t minus one, which is zero, times 25 cents, which is zero. So one cut didn't cost anything, just the 225 fee. If I make two cuts, two minus one is one, one times 25 cents is 25 cents for the two cuts because one is free. So this is our equation. So it says, what is the function? There it is. What is the equation of this function? This is the equation. Be sure to define the variables in the context of the problem. Okay, well, y equals total cost. x equals number of cuts. Okay, so there's a. b says use the equation to determine Lemoyne's total cost for cutting. I need to keep looking at that picture. How many cuts do we have? Okay, well, this is a board that they're, it's called ripping when you go the same direction. And then a cut here and a cut here. So there's one, two, three cuts. So I'm going to use this equation, y equals 0.25 x minus 1 plus 2.25. And like I said, there are three cuts here, so we're going to write y equals 0.25 times 3 minus 1 plus $2.25. y equals 0.25, and 3 minus 1 is 2, plus 2.25. So y equals 0.50 plus 2.25. Okay, and that therefore is y equals $2.75. In the context of this problem, interpret the slope of the equation in words. This slope is cost per cut um, is there any more we want to say about that? Cost per cut after first cut first cut was free. So the slope is how much it's changing every time. How much did the price increase for each cut after the first cut? That's the way to say it. Okay, D, interpret the y-intercept of your equation in words in the context of the problem. Well, the y-intercept is when you have had no cuts done, or maybe even, actually not no cuts, one cut. You're not going to set up the machine and charge two twenty-five and say, ah, "I'm not going to cut it." That makes no sense. So if you get one cut, that first cut is free, so that would still be zero plus the setup fee. So the y-intercept is the cost to make one cut after setup, because I charge two twenty-five to set up the machine. And then the first cut's free, so therefore the price didn't change. The setup fee is the setup fee. Okay, number 11. Omar and Olivia were curious about the size of coins. They measured the diameter and circumference of each 
of several coins and found the following data. Okay, for starters, they wasted their time because if you measure the diameter, you can calculate the circumference by saying circumference equals pi d. So all they had to do is measure the diameter, multiply it by pi, and they'd get the circumference. Okay, let me see if their table is correct. I love this kind of stuff. Let's check. 19 times pi. Point five nine six nine point five nine seven. Looky there, they did it correctly. Okay, wondering if there was any relationship between diameter and circumference, they thought about drawing a picture, draw a scatter plot that displays circumference in terms of diameter. Okay, so if we're going to do a scatter plot, let me bring one in. I can't draw that; it'll take a long time. So I'm just going to pause the video and bring one in. Okay, so here we go. This is nice and neat and straight, and it says, wondering if there's any relationship between, draw a picture, draw a scatter plot that displays these values. So I have a independent variable diameter. I have a dependent variable circumference. I have a penny, nickel, dime, quarter, half dollar diameter in millimeters, 19 comma, 19 is halfway between 18 and 20, and just under 60 is about here. 21 is here, a little bit more, and then 6666, so somewhere around here. And then we have 17.9, which is down here below 18, and 56.2, which is about here. Okay, so as you can see, it looks like they're in a straight line, so we need to continue. 24.3 is approximately here. And going up to 76 would be about here. So as you see, they're still in a nice straight line. And then 30.6, here's 31, just a little bit behind. And up to 96, so that's way up here somewhere, right around here. So there's our dot plot, scatter plot for that data. Is there a relationship? Uh, yes, it's a positive correlation and it's very strong and actually it looks linear because as the diameter of the coin increases, the circumference increases. Do you think that the circumference and diameter are related? And the answer is, hopefully from prior knowledge, you'd say yes. Circumference equals pi times the diameter. And that's actually for down here. Okay, but let's assume that we don't remember that circumference equals pi times diameter. Let's try to find the rate of change. And that's our slope, or our rate of change. So I'd say m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if I go back, y to, I can pick any of these points. So, okay, so I brought the table in so I don't have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. So let's just do the first two. So this is y1 and this is y2 and this, these two, x1, x2. So y1 minus y2 equals, or y2 minus y1 is 66.6 .6 minus 59.7 over x2, 21.2 minus 19.0. Well, 59.7 is 0.3 to 60, so there's 6.9 if I did my calculation correctly. And 21.2 minus 19 is 2.2. So if I get my calculator, 6.9 divided by 2.2 equals... 3.14 when that rounds, okay? That's an approximation. 3.136, 3.14. So therefore, my equation is y equals my rate of change times my x, or my d in this case. So I could change that from C and to say C and D. 
So circumference equals 3.14d and 3.14 is pi. B, the value of the slope is approximately equal to the value of pi. Explain why this makes sense. Okay, well, why does that make sense? Because circumference is 3.14 times diameter, or pi is equivalent to the ratio of circumference divided by diameter. What is the value of, of the y-intercept? And explain why this makes sense. Okay, so the value of the y-intercept is 0. Because if a coin has a diameter... of zero, then the circumference would equal 3.14 times the diameter, which equals zero. But in this case, the y-intercept is nothing's being added. If the circumference is 3.14 times one, then the circumference is 3.14, and that's how much it changed. So we started at zero, zero, and we went to 1 comma 3.14 and so on and so on we are not adding anything to this equation so the y-intercept is 0 we're not adding anything to 3.14 D C equals 3.14 D plus 0 would be the linear equation and this is the y-intercept we aren't adding anything to these values there is no constant being added Okay, that is the end of lesson 10. Review the lesson summary and go to your problem set.